As you enjoy your lunch, um, we're going to get started on the keynote presentation. Um, once again, my name is Blair Bowie. I'm one of the six Toll Scholars who, along with many others, have helped to put together this symposium today. And it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Brenda Wright, who is the Vice President of Policy and Legal Solutions at Demos. So a few months ago, the other Toll Scholars and I sat down to figure out the theme of today's symposium. Um, and we were looking for a common link between our areas of interest. And we're a group with a wide variety of interests. There's a number of different things that keep us up at night that you see reflected in the different themes of the panels today. Reforming education, opening the doors to economic opportunity, developing foreign policy that aids rather than exploits the rest of the world, creating fairness in an overzealous and misdirected criminal justice system, and vindicating civil rights violations. So, wide variety of concerns and goals amongst our group. But it didn't take us too long to realize that underlying these different problems are various policies and practices that seem to obviously serve the most wealthy special interests in our society and not the general public and certainly not those who need it the most. So our vision for the symposium has been to provide a forum for some of the best minds in those various fields to get together and talk about ways that we can make sure that the doors of economic opportunity and justice are open to everyone regardless of how much money he or she has. But at the same time, we would be remiss to not talk about our most powerful tool for enacting social change, which is mobilizing our democratic processes to create policies for systemic solutions. Unfortunately, our democratic processes are subject to the very same problems that we've been discussing in these substantive policy areas. That is to say, our democratic process is being co-opted to give disproportionate voice to those wealthiest interests who are benefited by the very policies that we would like to use the system to change. We could not be happier to have Ms. Wright here to expound on that point and to talk to us about the solutions that can help protect our democracy and give us back those tools we need to tackle these other substantive problems. A graduate of Yale Law School and Bryn Mawr College, Ms. Wright has held key roles at some of the most impactful democracy groups across the country, including the National Voting Rights Institute, the Voting Rights Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. She serves on the board of Common Cause Massachusetts, and as a member of the advisory board on the Prison Policy Initiative. Needless to say, she is an expert in all measure of democracy and electoral reform issues, and she has argued both voting rights and campaign finance cases before the United States Supreme Court. Currently, Ms. Wright is Vice President for Policy and Legal Solutions at Demos, which is a nimble and potent public policy organization focused on building an America where we all have an equal say in our democracy and an equal chance in our economy. We are so pleased to welcome Ms. Wright to talk with us about how the deck is stacked and most importantly, about how we can fight back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Blair. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, and especially um, the invitation coming from Blair Bowie, who I've had the privilege to work with when she was in her former life as an a, a advocate with the U.S. Public Interest Research Group. And in fact, in full disclosure, a couple of the slides I've uh, got here today for you come from a report that Blair co-authored with one of my colleagues. So that's how we're sort of stacking the deck on our side on these issues. Um, if, if you cannot hear me at any point, please raise your hand or speak up, because I know that that can be kind of difficult. Um, there are some uh, pluses and minuses about being a lunchtime speaker at an event like this that I just want to uh, comment on. Uh, one of the, I think probably the big advantage is that if you have an all-day conference um, and there's a free lunch with it, 
people are probably going to stay and have the lunch. So your audience is, is secure, at least for that time. Uh, the downside is that uh, people, a lot of people would like to just eat lunch. So I do want to encourage you, go ahead and eat your lunch. Uh, it won't bother me at all. And I don't want to um, prevent anybody from doing that. Um, but uh, with that, let me sort of go into uh, my talk. And given that it is Friday and that uh, we're heading into the weekend. I thought maybe I'd start with a little bit of preview of Saturday morning cartoons. And uh, the thing that I uh, like about this cartoon and that I appreciate about cartoonists in general is that uh, they have a way of being able to take a complex and incredibly lengthy Supreme Court decision uh, and summarize the decision and its impact um, in just uh, one image and a tiny bit of text. Um, I think that the, uh, one of the things I really love about this particular cartoon is that uh, it channels uh, a thinker, a 19th century French essayist named Anatole France. How many people are familiar with Anatole France? Okay, great. Uh, for audiences who are not, I sometimes like to describe him as a 19th century version of Stephen Colbert. Um, one of his most famous um, aphorisms uh, is about the law, and it's channeled in this cartoon. And that aphorism is that the law in its majestic impartiality forbids rich and poor alike from sleeping under bridges and begging for alms in the street. And when the Citizens United decision first came down, my very first metaphor that came to mind for me was that the Supreme Court had now given us the Anatole France First Amendment, which is reflected in this cartoon. And it's a First Amendment in which the poorest people and the richest people alike are now free to spend as much money as they want electing their preferred candidates to office. So I think it's a good framing for us to keep in mind in thinking about the problems we want to address today. Um, and much of the conversation uh, thus far this morning and that we'll be continuing into the afternoon, uh, I think is based on an underlying premise that money in politics is distorting our democracy and is in turn distorting public policy. Uh, that is a premise. I don't think there's a need to belabor it with a lot of facts and figures, but I think that it's good to at least fill in the frame a little bit on the magnitude of the problem that we're talking about and the differences between those who participate in politics through massive expenditures of money and the rest of us who don't. So this... Um, this slide here, which is one of the ones that uh, Blair Bowie uh, helped put together in her prior life, um, I think is a good illustration of what is wrong with our current system of financing elections. And what it shows you is, we're talking about Sheldon Adelson, whose name has come up before uh, today. And uh, we could bring up other examples as well on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, this is just an example. So in the 2012 election cycle, his total giving and spending on politics was $91.8 million, almost $92 million. Now you could look at that and say, well, gosh, you know, he must really, really care about the issues to give that much of his wealth. And he does care about the issues. He cares deeply about uh, Israel and many other issues. Um, but that's got to be like, what, half of his net worth? No. <laughs> And when you drill down deeper, you kind of see the inequalities that we're talking about here. We looked at, well, what does this represent, actually, in terms of his net worth, and found that it was 0.37% of his net worth at that time. So that would be the equivalent of an average American family giving $285 to a candidate, right? Equivalent proportion of their median net worth. Now, that's a lot of money for a lot of families who are living at the medium uh, income level. But what makes you really stop and pause is thinking about the fact that it would take 322,000 people 
contributing at that level to equal the spending that one individual uh, was able to do in that election. And when, when that's the situation, we really can't say that we're living in a country of political equals. Another way to illustrate this point uh, comes from a, a report by the Sunlight Foundation. They decided to take a close look at the, what they call the 1% of the 1% of the US population in terms of political donations. And again, I believe this is based on 2012 uh, federal election data. That's about 31,000 people out of the 310 million or so people in the United States. And they found that of the donations that are disclosed in federal elections, more than a quarter of them came from that tiny, tiny 1% of the 1%. That 84% of congressional candidates received more funding from that 1% of the 1% than from all of their small donors combined. And the Sunlight Foundation actually found that there wasn't a single person elected to Congress who didn't receive support from that group in one way or another. You look at the median contribution that was made by this 1% of the 1%, and it was about $26,000, $27,000. Compare that to the average starting salary for a teacher, $36,000. Again, maybe something that people kind of know, but I think it's helpful to put some numbers and some meat on the bones about the issue of too much money in politics coming from too few people who are very wealthy and who don't necessarily have the same priorities as the rest of us. And note that this is mostly a problem uh, of political equality, in my view, and not simply of corruption or bribery. I'll say more about that uh, in a moment. So, why this matters. Um, to get the kind of money that you need to keep up with uh, the spending race these days and to get uh, these donations from the 1% of the 1% or whoever the largest spenders are, you have to spend a lot of time talking and schmoozing with these folks. If you are a candidate for the US Senate, you have to raise $3,300 every day for six years to keep up with the spending of the median winner. And people like Senator Chris Murphy have commented about you know, what that means in terms of who you hear from and what you hear about. And the quote up on the screen sort of encapsulates that, that in that call room where you're sitting and just dialing number after number, uh, hour after hour, he talked about, that he talked a lot more about carried interest uh, in that call room than he did when he was in the supermarket out meeting with people. And the people that he's calling for those dollars have fundamentally dif uh, different interests than other people in his state. So we can put a finer point on this with um, more recent political science research uh, that has really started taking a close look at uh, the preferences of the very affluent and how they do or do not differ from the preferences of the, of the rest of us. And, and that matters because if you think about sort of a thought experiment, the influence of the wealthiest people on our politics wouldn't really matter that much in a world where the policy preferences of the wealthiest donors pretty well match the preferences of the general public. At least you would have what some of these authors are calling democracy by coincidence, right? So uh, even if their preferences, dif uh, even if they're giving more money, um, it wouldn't matter as much if their preferences matched those of the general public. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the situation that we have. Um, uh, uh, a researcher named uh, Martin Gillens has written a very important book that I recommend to you, Affluence and Influence. Um, and he looks at uh, the, the different policy preferences and priorities of the wealthiest Americans compared to those of the general public. You can you know, look at this in a number of ways. Um, in those sort of Gallup polls that, or national polls that ask people to just name an issue that's important to them. Um, 
you see the wealthiest respondents at a rate three to one saying the deficit is a, is a most important a problem compared to the general public, right? And then conversely, the general public saying at a level of 26%, the first issue that I can think of that matters to me the most, unemployment, wealthy respondents, only 11%. Very dramatic differences. Uh, on some issues, um, the preferences of the of wealthiest individuals uh, match up with those of the general public. And again, I guess that's uh, democracy by coincidence. But where you see some of the biggest differences are really on the core issues of economic uh, opportunity and economic um, equality that are so important in American politics. So looking at this uh, next figure, Let's just look at the ones where the general public clearly has a very strong view. The first one, government must see that no one is without food, clothing, or shelter. Almost 70% of the general public agrees with that. Only 43% of the uh, most affluent Americans. The minimum wage uh, should be high enough so that no family with a full-time worker falls below the official poverty line. The general public, more than three quarters, agrees with that, only 40% of the most affluent Americans. And uh, then on the basic idea that uh, government ought to see to it that everyone who wants to work can find a job, again, a pretty basic tenet of economic equality and opportunity. Almost 70% of the general public agrees with that, only 19% of the most affluent. So, the influence that folks are getting because of the way they participate in, in politics through the massive infusion of money that it takes to fuel the current system uh, is very, very important for how policies get enacted and adopted in the United States. You can see this out with um, the minimum wage itself. It's not just that the opinions differ, um, but the outcomes here are very clear. The real value of the federal minimum wage has been dropping and dropping since 1968. That doesn't reflect the policy preference of the vast majority of Americans. It does reflect the policy preference of the wealthiest who are part of the donor class. We're going to have a panel talking about the cost of economic opportunity this afternoon, so I think that it's directly related to that. There's going to be a, a panel talking about um, criminal justice issues. If you look at mass incarceration, the rise of the private prison industry uh, means that corporations have an investment in keeping cells filled and economic clout to court politicians on criminal justice policy. So you can see it playing out in many ways. Another, you know, that sort of bottom line uh, that you can um, illustrate about where we are based on our, our current system of campaign finance and, and many other factors as well, of course. The staggering inequality uh, that we currently see in the United States in income. And you could do a similar chart uh, on wealth. This chart happens to be on income. The, the, the line in orange, in case you can't see it very well, shows where that inequality was in the 1920s, right before the Great Depression. Um, and what this shows is, you know, what the, what the squiggly line uh, shows is the share of income received by the top 0.01% of the population um, compared to others. So what you can see is that in about the 2005, 2007 um, uh, period, we blew past the income inequality that we had right before the stock market crash in 1929. And today, we are still well above that level. Another thing that really matters about the fact that so much money is being contributed to our political system by so few people, is that money in politics is 
a civil rights issue uh, as well as an, over, uh, an issue of overall uh, equality and inequality. So if you look at uh, the folks who give money to presidential campaigns uh, at a $200 level or above, the donors who fuel campaigns are overwhelmingly white. Over 90% of donations come from majority white neighborhoods, and by comparison, only 4%, 3%, and less than 1% come from Latino, African American, and Asian neighborhoods, respectively. I don't know if uh, folks are old enough here to have played Pac-Man or Ms. Pac-Man, but I just sort of look at that and feel like somebody is getting swallowed up by somebody else when I look at that figure. Um, money in politics is a civil rights issue also because, you know, given the importance of money in our current political system, candidates uh, don't have much incentive to prioritize communities of color and their needs. Larry Bartels um, is another of the political scientists looking at these issues. And one of the things that he discovered in his research, and again, sort of continuing on the theme of uh, democracy by coincidence, um, the preferences of people in the bottom third of the income distribution, according to his research, have no apparent impact on the behavior of their elected officials. So again, that doesn't mean that the policy preferences of the lowest third of the income distribution never get enacted into law. They do, if they coincide with the policy preferences of those of higher income. But who does that affect? Because where, where those policy preferences don't coincide, the policies don't get, uh, don't get enacted. Look at the share of US households that are in the lowest third of the income distribution in the United States. And because of our country's history of racial discrimination in so many areas of life, uh, we see that that's 53% of African Americans. It's 45% of Latino Americans. It's 32% of white Americans, 30% of Asian Americans. Our system of money in politics also creates barriers for candidates of color in even running for office. It's a barrier today, just like the poll tax and the literacy test was decades ago. If you don't have the money, you can't really enter the race with any effectiveness. And where that leaves us um, also is that communities of color are very underrepresented descriptively in the United States. This is a map I really like um, created by the Women's uh, Donor Network showing what does our country look like in actual demo demographics today. It's 31% white men, 32% white women, 19% women of color, 19% men of color. By comparison, what do our elected, what are the demographics of our elected officials? Very, very different. And one of the you know, issues that I could probably have brought another whole deck of slides on and didn't um, is to talk about how voting doesn't necessarily make up for all of this, right? Because we have problems in our voting process as well that disproportionately affect um, people of color. We have an antiquated registration system that keeps far too many eligible voters off the rolls. And when people of color do make gains in registration and turnout, as we've seen in the 2008 and 2012 presidential elections, there's an immediate backlash, both in the Supreme Court, if you look at the Shelby County decision that struck down a key provision of the Voting Rights Act in 2012, um, and in the wave of vote suppression laws that has been enacted in many states throughout our country requiring uh, unnecessarily restrictive forms of photo identification, cutbacks on early voting, uh, and all of these uh, vote suppression measures that are taking us backward. So I'm gonna say a few more words about the role of the Supreme Court 
around where we are in money and politics before I start getting to the solutions uh, part of this, because I know it could be easy for folks to be feeling a little depressed by this conversation. Um, it, it, the role of the Supreme Court, uh, it, it's really important, I think, to understand, A, how important it is, and B, that it doesn't just go back to Citizens United. So I think there's a lot of folks on the progressive side of the equation who are looking at the upcoming presidential election and saying, gosh, if we just get one to new Supreme Court justice who's more moderate, we can overturn Citizens United, because it was a five to four decision, right? So if we do that, we're back to what one of my colleagues calls the halcyon days of 2009, right? We have to understand that the problem that of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence around money and politics is deeper and goes back further than uh, Citizens United. And I think I would really trace it to uh, the 1976 decision in Buckley versus Vallejo, which is going to enjoy its 40th birthday this coming January. Um, in that decision, uh, the seeds were laid for where we are today. And one of the most damaging statements in that decision, or honestly in, in any decision on money and politics uh, that I know of, was the statement that the, the concept that government may restrict the speech of some in order to enhance the relative voices of others is wholly foreign to the First Amendment. With that sentence, the court ruled out the value of political equality as a permissible interest for Congress or the states or municipalities to pursue in regulating the flow of money into politics. And the Supreme Court uh, in the Roberts era has eagerly uh, picked that up and taken it even further. Um, under Buckley, you still had the door open for certain policies such as contribution limits, a pragmatic definition of corruption uh, that could allow for regulation um, uh, of, of, of things like aggregate expenditures. But the Roberts Court has decimated even those remaining approaches to regulating money in politics. So off the table today are candidate spending limits, limits on independent expenditures, limits on self-funding, contribution limits set at levels that average Americans can actually afford, uh, public matching funds uh, for, for publicly financed elections, bans on direct corporate election spending, limits on corporate, uh, sham corporate issue ads. So if we're going to fix this problem, we're going to need to go back, not just to Citizens United, uh, but to Buckley versus Vallejo. And I think there are you know, two basic strategies in terms of the way forward. One strategy is about lowering the ceiling. Uh, that means limiting, being able to limit the undue influence of big money. This absolutely requires rescuing our Constitution from the Anatole France Supreme Court. Uh, another solution is to raise the floor, to use policies that lift up all of our voices to balance out the influence of the wealthy. And some of those policies remain constitutional under current Supreme Court jurisprudence. So I'm going to say a few words about uh, those initially. So the concept of raising the floor as a way of dealing with the imbalance of money in politics there's a number of basic approaches that uh, states and localities can use, and Congress too, if it could ever find the political will. Uh, one is to use public funds to help give everybody a voice. And so that could mean matching small contributions. A contribution of $100 in New York City is matched at a six to one level. So it becomes $600. So all of a sudden, the $100 contributor becomes important to people running for offices in a way that uh, otherwise wouldn't be true. Providing a voucher that citizens can give to their preferred candidates or parties or causes. And the idea of providing a tax credit uh, for small contributions. These are all ways of, <clears throat> excuse me, lifting up the voices of small donors in our system. Just this week in Seattle, there was some good news for campaign finance reform along these lines. The city of Seattle passed a, uh, an ordinance by ballot initiative that calls for providing $100 in vouchers 
to each uh, citizen to be used to, you know, you can give it to a mayoral campaign, you can give it to a city council candidate, you can give it to a candidate for city attorney. It's up to the voter to decide how to distribute that money, but again, it makes small donors important in the process. Um, another way of going about reducing the role of private money in the system is to put public funding, um, give out public, gra uh, public funded grants to candidates in order to allow them to run for office without relying on big donors. <clears throat> uh, this again had a, a victory on Tuesday, uh, this form of, of uh, reform in Maine. In Maine, the voters overwhelmingly passed a ballot initiative to shore up the public financing system that they've had in that state for quite some time. And uh, systems like this have been used successfully in other states. In Connecticut is a great example. They implemented public financing for elections in 2008. Latino representation in the legislature immediately increased. Women now make up 32% of the Connecticut legislature, and since those elections have become primarily publicly funded because of high participation by candidates. The legislature has passed mandatory sick days, increased minimum wage, in, uh, and, and earned income tax credit at the state level, and passed in-state tuition for undocumented students. All of these things were stalled in Connecticut previously, but have come to pass since public financing was adopted. So in terms of the other option, lowering the ceiling, that's what requires us to go back and have a transformation in the Supreme Court's jurisprudence. That is obviously not an easy task to undertake, but it has, is something that we have done over and over again in our history. If you look at um, where we were on Plessy versus Ferguson, we had to take a long, long journey to overcome the doctrine of separate but equal. And I believe that we have a similarly important journey to undertake in overcoming the Supreme Court decisions that are preventing us from regulating the role of money in politics in the way we need to. I think that most of all, the court uh, has been asking the wrong question in simply asking about are these donations actually corrupting candidates and making them vote differently than they might otherwise have voted? And that's because the court back in Buckley, as I said, eliminated the rationale of political equality. The right question is, is this system fair to people who don't participate in, money, in politics through vast expenditures of money, who don't have the means to do that? That is the right question to ask. And we need a new Supreme Court jurisprudence that allows us to frame up that value um, in interpreting the First Amendment and the rest of the Constitution. So, and, and that's sort of what I mean by a long-term campaign and that overturning Citizens United really isn't enough. We need to develop a whole new jurisprudence. And there are many scholars, uh, many ways of approaching this. There are scholars like Spencer Overton who are looking at the critical interest in robust participation as a uh, constitutional value that should be lifted up. People like Robert Post at Yale, who's looking at the importance of a legitimate, well-functioning democracy um, as a basis for uh, regulating campaign finance. Many approaches, and you know, in particular, I think we really need to lift up the value of political equality under our Constitution as one of those values. Uh, that we need to embed in our jurisprudence in, uh, in regulating the role of money in politics. So how do you go about uh, undertaking that kind of change? Lewis Powell, 40 years ago, you may have heard, uh, when he was a lawyer for the uh, US Chamber of Commerce, wrote a memo outlining uh, how corporations could use the Constitution to advance their interests. And, it's part of what has brought us to where we are today with Citizens United and Buckley versus Vallejo. So we need to have a similar vision uh, to guide us going forward. We need to, as I said, develop 
in the academy and disseminate among thought leaders and the public uh, new ways of understanding and interpreting the Constitution. We need to mobilize allies and the public to support these alternative ideas. We need to ensure that future justices on the court share the public's common sense view of the Constitution with respect to money and politics. So for so long, uh, the issue of money and politics has not been one of those questions that is raised around Supreme Court nominations. We really need to change that. Um, so that is sort of a basic outline of what we need to do to ultimately establish a governing interpretation of the Constitution that empowers people to pass common sense limits on the use of big money in politics. Uh, another way forward, of course, is just to go straight at a constitutional amendment, right? The one way to directly overrule the Supreme Court without persuading the justices to change their minds is to do that through a constitutional amendment. And uh, there, there are several such amendments uh, pending in Congress. One is the Democracy for All Amendment. It, it deals with campaign finance and not so much directly with uh, corporate power specifically, but it, it explicitly allows policymakers to distinguish between corporations and other entities in regulating money and politics. Actually got a majority vote in the US Senate in September. 16 states and hundreds of municipalities have passed resolutions calling for a constitutional amendment. And I think it's a great organizing tool uh, for people who want to see reform in our system. So I think I'm gonna wrap up here very soon because I wanna make sure we have time for plenty of questions. I will say that um, there's one reform on the table that I think we should not uh, try to go with or pursue, and that is the idea of an Article V constitutional convention uh, that some scholars have put forward. Um, my concern about that is uh, that we have never done that since Philadelphia. Uh, and although it would be great to think about another constitutional convention here or elsewhere, in theory, uh, I'm very concerned that there's simply no way to regulate the kinds of issues that a true constitutional convention would take up. The closest uh, number of votes that we have for convening a constitutional convention among the states right now is for a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. So, there are so many policies that we simply cannot afford to embed in our Constitution. I don't think that's the right way to go about uh, making change here. But I hope that, you know, given the, what I've said here today and what you're hearing from the other panelists today, folks really understand that if you believe in a strong democracy that reflects the will of the people and allows all voters to be heard, we have obviously a lot of work to do. We have work to do in states and cities to support and enact reforms that magnify the role of small donors to replace private influence with public financing. We have work to do on reforming our antiquated rules on voter registration, to bring our election system into the 21st century, fight the folks who are trying to drag us back to the 19th century on issues of race and voting. And we have work to do long term on the Supreme Court to lay the groundwork for transforming constitutional interpretation around money and politics and achieve a democracy that lives up to the ideal of self-government by we the people. And if we do all that, hopefully we'll be able to keep the Supreme Court uh, off of the Cartoon Channel. Thank you.
Well, that's, I mean, that's a really, really big issue. Um, because I think you're kind of pointing out that even if we solve the barrier of money in politics, there are other barriers as well. I think, though, that one of the biggest really is today the idea that in order to get where you want to be in office, you've got to be talking to all kinds of people who have the money to finance your campaign. Um, and if that's not your constituency, well, then you've got to figure out how to talk to those folks. Um, and it just, it changes people. And so I, we really look at systems of public financing, such as Seattle just adopted on the, the voucher model, uh, Connecticut's public financing system, Maine's public financing system. You know, in Maine, you know, they've got waitresses, they've got truck drivers, they've got ordinary people who are able to serve in the legislature. When you take out that um, requirement that you sit in a room dialing for dollars to people that you don't even know, when you can do a campaign by raising small contributions from your friends and neighbors and people who know you, it makes a big difference. And um, in terms of motivating people around the rigors of serving in elected office, you know, I think we need to do a lot more around civic education in our schools. We've completely dropped that off the map. And although it's not an issue, it's not a advocacy area that Demos is directly involved in, I see that more and more coming up uh, as, 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 as being lifted up as something of great importance because it's, it's true that, and, and, and that's another reason why we don't like the corruption frame to talk about money in politics. The more you talk about how corrupt everybody is and how they're all a bunch of crooks, and if that's the only thing we can say about what's wrong with money in politics, we are turning people off from politics. It would be so much more uplifting if we could say, you know, we gotta keep money out because that's the right way to lift up everybody's voices. Not because these people who are out there are crooks. Most of them are not, but they're caught in a system that they have to deal with and that they, where they have to raise these vast amounts uh, in order to run. Well, I think you speak to a deep yearning among a lot of people for exactly that kind of amendment. You know, corporations, whatever Mitt Romney might have said, corporations are not people, my friend. And we shouldn't, you know, I totally agree with you that we should not be treating artificial entities created by state laws as if they were real uh, breathing human people. Um, I guess, you know, I agree with you, but feel like we have to go further, because that would overturn Citizens United, but wouldn't take us the rest of the way. But I think that's, that's why you're seeing so much mobilizing behind constitutional amendments. It really speaks to people. And people really, I think, totally agree with what you're saying. The, you know, the revenue sources for public financing um, uh, regimes have come from a number of places. There's no one, you know, formula that fits all states. Um, it is true that it takes public money in order to fund elections um, in a way that is not dependent uh, on private funds. Uh, I think that a lot of folks really have the conviction that if we can take the private money out of the equation or at least make it possible for people to run without private money, we're gonna get uh, you know, 
a return on our investment, so to speak, that far exceeds the cost uh, of, of funding those campaigns with public funds. So we're not going to be seeing as much in terms of tax breaks for the 1% of the 1% um, offshore tax havens for corporations, just the litany of policies that are out there that are costing every one of us every day. So those, I mean, those are the arguments that typically are used to sell those systems. Again, it's, you know, it's not just tax this or tax that. Um, every, every state has a different set of you know, revenue options that are out there. So I wouldn't want to describe uh, just one as the holy grail.